I go ahead, Chairman Kerry. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. Today is Tuesday, September 8th, 2020, and we are being held virtually in accordance with the governor's executive order. May we have roll call, Ellen? Yes, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Here. Mrs. Evans? Mrs. Granado? Present. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Here. Mr. Riley? Here. Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. And Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Present. All present. Thank you, Ellen. Now for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Hammer, can you lead us in the pledge? I sure can. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you. Moving on to approval minutes. Mr. Ryan, I believe you have a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of August 25th. Second. Thank you, Ms. Paradis. Seeing a motion second, is there any comments on the meeting minutes from August 25th? Seeing no comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to public comment. I received no emails. Mr. Emmett, anyone on the phone? No, sir. We have no one in the queue. Thank you. Moving on to communications, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Good evening, everyone. i uh, certainly like to welcome everyone back to the 2020-2021 school year. The new school year kicked off last Tuesday with our first cohort arriving for in-person learning on Tuesday and Wednesday, and cohort two coming in on Thursday and Friday. Uh, those in opposite cohorts were able to join classes virtually using their technology devices. The compliance with wearing masks among the students was excellent over the course of this past week within the school buildings. And I also want to report that the reopening committee will be meeting tomorrow afternoon to debrief and review the latest guidance that's been released from the Departments of Health and Education. Uh, the Department of Public Health continues to hold their weekly Health and Safety Tuesday meetings. Our nursing supervisor, Chloe Bobrowski, as well as myself, attend these meetings each week. These meetings provide us with the opportunity to ask health-related questions, as well as interpretation of guidance provided by the DPH and the Education Department. Frequent topics include mask guidelines, communication of positive cases, and attendance. With regard to technology, our technology devices are in the hands of our students for use at home and at school. Uh, in talking with some of my area colleagues, I know there are districts that are struggling to get shipments of Chromebooks uh, due to delays. I'm pleased to report that we are in good shape with regard to our devices at this juncture. Uh, one reminder to students, we found this out last week, is to please remember to charge those Chromebooks before in-person learning to ensure that you have adequate battery life. We saw that at the high school last week. One aspect that our tech team continues to approach very seriously is the issue of cybersecurity. As you likely heard today, one of our local uh, area districts suffered a ransomware attack that disabled critical infrastructure and led to the district being unable to open. Our team has assessed our system this morning and will continue to monitor our technology infrastructure. And we have an update on fall sports, as you're likely aware, after a great deal of uncertainty, the CIAC decided last week to align with Department of Public Health guidance and not move forward with a full contact football season. The CIAC did allow for girls volleyball to take place this fall with masks being a requirement. Fall sports currently continue with non-contact conditioning and practice parameters will increase on September 21st if conditions remain favorable. Competition would begin on October 1st. Again, if conditions remain favorable. This timeline is going to be contingent upon favorable health metrics that we get from both the State Department of uh, Public Health as well as the Central Connecticut Health District. 
I will certainly let you know if the CIAC makes any further adjustments to football as they discussed exploring ways to provide football players with a low to moderate risk experience. What that looks like remains to be seen. And finally this evening, I wanted to make sure I got the message out. This will be coming out via school messenger as well as going up on our social media platforms. The uh, Weathersfield Public Schools are proud to announce that free breakfast and lunch availability will be effective tomorrow through December 31st of 2020. Weathersfield Public Schools and Chartwell's Dining Services are pleased to offer free breakfast and lunch for all Weathersfield children age 18 and under. The service is available to all students, whether present in school or learning from home. For remote learners on days without in-person instruction, children and their parents or guardians can visit Weathersfield High School between 1030 and noon, Monday through Friday, to pick up a prepared lunch along with breakfast for the subsequent day. Children and their parents or guardians will enter and exit Weathersfield High via the community entrance off J Street. An online order form must be completed prior to pickup and can be accessed using the link below, which we'll post up on our social media website. And it's available from 3 p.m. the day prior until 8.30 a.m. the day of service. So we are absolutely thrilled about this. Um, we were fortunate to serve well over 40,000 meals from March um, throughout the course of the summer. So this is a great uh, process to be able to offer to our families. And again, Matt Kazaka, thanks to you and the business office for doing the necessary work with regard to a waiver uh, coming from the feds as well as the state. And with that, that's communications. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Moving on to a recommended motion of approval of textbook for the adoption of AP psychology. Mr. Healy, do you have a motion for us? Uh, yes, I do. As soon as I can find it, uh, I got it right here. Sorry, I was eating a cupcake. <laughs> Your birthday. No. Uh, vacation. Um, Okay, I make a motion to approve the textbook adoption for AP Psychology, Meyer Psychology for AP Course, third edition. And I'll second that motion. Thank you. Mr. Stoley, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, we have a high school textbook adoption committee at the high school that uh, reviewed um, different textbook samples. Uh, our previous book was 2007, which is outdated in the eyes and requirements of the um, College Board for AP textbooks. Uh, so we do, uh, we'll be purchasing both the hard copy and the online version because they bundled together for a, a price that's um, too good to not get both the hard copy and the electronic version, but the um, online version has a lot of student-friendly features. Um, there'll be a great benefit to our students within the course. So we're excited to bring this book forward for um, adoption. Thank you. Any board members with questions? Sally, I, how, many, how many kids in AP psych? How many kids? Uh, we'll be We'll be ordering 125 books. I believe the last count was about 114 students. Oh, wonderful. Um, at the last Thank count. You. Yes, it's yeah, a, I know. really. It's a, uh, things change day by day now. Yep. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, I'd just like to comment, Chuck, on the, the book. I said it before the meeting started. I was fascinated. Um, Sally sent out a um, way that we could look through the book. And um, actually, it's so challenging that I was getting nervous. But it is a wonderful book. Um, these authors come highly recommended. I was checking on them too. So um, I appreciate all the work that went into this committee to find this book. Excellent. Any other comments? All right, seeing none with a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Good. Moving on to reports and discussions. A presentation on remote Wednesday, Mr. Emmett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Carey. Um, the first two weeks of our school year have uh, been marked by two weeks of short weeks. Uh, we didn't start until last Tuesday, and then again yesterday we celebrated Labor Day. Um, we wanted to be able to provide members of the public an opportunity to understand what that um, remote learning day is going to look like on Wednesday. So I'd like to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Destoli at this time for a brief presentation. 
Thank you, Mr. Emmett. I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, so, Mr. Emmett, can you enable me so I can share my screen? Yep, should be all set. Perfect. So, I'm going to provide a brief overview as to what to expect on our remote Wednesdays. Um, as Mr. Emmett said, um, they will be starting shortly next. Uh, Wednesday, um, September 16th, and we do have six remote Wednesdays through the month of October, and you'll see those dates highlighted in orange on this slide. So Mr. Emmett did share a correspondence uh, out with the district on August 10th um, with this definition in this chart around um, that most students will participate in asynchronous learning opportunities on Wednesdays. Um, and some may be scheduled for synchronous remote meetings. Um, our buildings will be closed. However, the Stillman building and school offices will be open as our organization is still open. And so we want to be able to facilitate those necessary tasks. There will be limited staff um, in the buildings, primarily a few 12 month employees to keep the buildings open. This will allow for deep cleaning, uh, longer dwell times and improved ventilation of the schools in between the cohorts on the days that we do have those remote Wednesdays. Um, we'll also have an opportunity for the IT team to be working in the buildings to support the technology infrastructure that we already talked about being so important to the backbone of our current model. So as an overview, um, we want to look at what these Wednesdays look like from a student viewpoint. So the majority of students will have independent work assigned to them on Wednesday um, through Google Classroom for students in grades 2 through 12 or Seesaw and our students in pre-K through grade uh, 1. Um, or, or and they may actually finish work that's been assigned to them on Monday or Tuesday. So most students will be having uh, asynchronous learning opportunities on on Wednesday um, while they're home. There will be some students uh, that need some additional support that may have some time scheduled with teachers. Teachers may do a small group. Um, they may have individual or small group meetings scheduled with tutors or paraprofessionals. So there will be some synchronous learning opportunities for some of our students, um, different to those that are happening on the other four days of the week. Um, our secondary staff will also be available for um, office hours for students. So students will be able to attend voluntary office hours to get extra help, ask questions, or clarity on assignments. Um, and even though our buildings are closed, um, athletics will still be running at Weathersfield High School after 2.30 on Wednesdays. So what does a remote Wednesday look like from a staff perspective? Um, first of all, um, our teachers will be participating in professional learning and collaboration opportunities. Um, as we go into this new model of hybrid, um, we can definitely build upon many of the things we've learned through distance learning, but there is also a huge learning curve around um, meeting student needs in the hybrid model. Um, learning more technology and really thinking about how to implement your curriculum in a hybrid model. So teachers, really, we want to emphasize a lot of time for professional learning and collaboration during those Wednesdays. Um, as I mentioned, tutors and paraprofessionals will be meeting with students in synchronous meets. Um, and uh, our teachers and our staff will also participate in professional meetings, such as staff meetings, parent meetings, 504s. And we also have a large number of PPTs, or planning and placement team meetings, that we need to uh, make up from the spring. Um, the important part that many of our meetings are on Wednesdays is because uh, with different arrival and dismissal procedures, we do have teachers on duty for longer periods of, of, of time, um, and that makes it hard to meet some of our contractual obligations for some of those professional meetings that usually occur after school. So this is a little bit of an overview, both from a staff and a student perspective. Um, I want to remind you that we continue to be fluid and flexible um, as we continue to make these plans. Really our goal is to build structures and supports that will maximize student supports, but also really um, make time for collaboration and professional learning for our staff during this new hybrid model. Um, an example of this came up today. 
um, we received some new guidance from the State Department of Education on attendance. And so one of the things we really need to continue to work through is looking at the new guidance from the State Department of Education on attendance um, and deciding how we're going to apply attendance for our students on these remote Wednesdays. So we have a group of administrators that will be coming together later this week to uh, continue to talk about that um, in light of some new guidance, which changed some of the thinking we've been working on related to attendance. So that's a little bit about uh, remote Wednesdays. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Any questions for Sally? Uh, Sally, I have one and it's about the PPTs and maybe John Karzar can answer this too. Are they virtual or are you gonna have them in person? Uh, yes, so we are uh, recommending that they are virtual. Um, if there's a specific um, you know, parent request we could have it in person, and if the uh, size of the PPT is large than what we could hold, we're actually looking at doing it right here at Stillman with some of our larger rooms, so we can make sure wearing masks. We can also still separate by the uh, you know recommended six feet. Thank you. Well, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Next presentation, Mr. Emmett, extended school year in class. Reports. Yes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Carey. Um, we, in spite of the fact we were closed over the course of the summer, learning continued um, with our annual extended school year program. We ran that virtually, as well as the continued learning across summer session, which was a regular ed initiative uh, mm -hmm. that kicked off over the course of the summer. I'd like to turn it over at this point in time to John Pizar, Liz Friedis, and Jennifer Lizzie Hammer. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Um, extended school year services, otherwise referred to as ESY services, are generally an exception to our students' programs who have IEPs, um, and they're not necessarily a general rule. Each year, the PPT team must determine the need for ESY services, and services are not our services are based on regression and recruitment of schools, as well as a non-regressive criteria, taking into consideration the severity of a child's disability, as well as their progress towards their goals and objectives, and several other factors. So this year, um, services, services are generally not limited to a single disability category, but must be discussed early enough by the team. Um, we gratefully were able to meet so many times um, prior to closure, um, and students' PPTs were held so that teams were able to make recommendations in a timely manner so that parents were um, aware of what um, our ESY program services would look like. However, despite our early meetings, the decisions for programming weighed heavily on us as we tried to figure out what ESY was going to look like during school closure. <laughs> So I hope that this provides an opportunity for the board um, to see how our teams walked through this decision-making process, was able to provide a very well-versed and significant amount of support to our students through our summer ESY program, um, as well as celebrate the opportunity um, for teachers and really recognize how much effort and time they put into making this program a success for the students that participated. John? Yeah, so actually I want to make sure, can people see the um, presentation on the? Yes, I can see it, John. Yes, John. Okay. And let me just skip ahead, sorry about that. And so, um, oops. first of all, it was a lot more difficult this year. And, um, um, you know, I guess I just want to uh, go on a little more with uh, what Liz was saying, because I'm not sure uh, how much information you know in regards to CSY. Um, and so a little more on the ESY uh, 101 synopsis. Um, really, ESY is uh, considered for all special ed students uh, during a PPT, a planning and placement team meeting, but really provided on an individual basis if the services are necessary to provide FAPE. And so for those of you, uh, special ed uses acronyms for everything. So FAPE means free and appropriate public education. And really it's up to the PPT to consider both regression and non-regression uh, factors. And that includes the uh, nature and severity of the disability or the student's progress to attain like self-sufficiency. While the non-regression factors really have more to do uh, with uh, um, 
student, students losing critical skills um, or failing their ability to recoup the skills typically as um, compared to typical peers. And so with this, um, a lot more complicated this year. Um, and I'm trying to think of the exact dates. It was uh, uh, May 20th. Yeah, May 20th um, that we received the uh, reopen Connecticut document. Um, and so at that point, we were supposed to start our ESY uh, one month later. And the reopen Connecticut document did have ways that we could go in person for ESY, uh, but we could not do it prior to July 6th. So at this point, um, you know, we talked a lot about how we could provide that safely, but we also um, surveyed our parents. And so with this, we did two separate surveys, one by uh, phone, um, the school messenger, and one by email. And just with a few questions, uh, the first is, I would prefer if extended school year was held, um, one, in person at web school, two, provided through distance learning, or three, a combination, or what were you now using as a hybrid approach of in-person and distance learning. And as you can see, there was a higher um, you know, number of parents that responded to the uh, in-person, um, uh, sorry, the distance learning. And so then also did, uh, would parents allow their children to participate, um, whether it was in-person at web or if it was distance learning. And as you can see by question two and three, um, a higher number of parents would have their child participate through uh, ESY through distance learning. And finally, at this point, we are also getting the questions about transportation and the uh, state recommendation that for the uh, summer, parents would transport. So we also asked that question of whether parents could provide transportation for their child at ESY. And so, um, you know, and in hindsight, we found out definitely the correct decision was made. Um, because I think it was actually the uh, first uh, week of ESY for two separate districts in the area. Not many went to uh, live in person, but two closed down, I think, with the, within the first week. Um, and I think the information we gained on the rest of the summer of how to open up a school was um, very important for us um, as we moved forward. And we have had a lot more information September 1st than we did on July 6th. So really good uh, information that we went ahead with. And so really for ESY, um, you know, when we uh, decided on the distance learning plan, we had to look at what is the purpose of what we were doing. We had to look at the, uh, you know, governor's uh, Connecticut reopening um, along with parent feedback to make the uh, right decision of uh, ESY, do, you know, through a distance learning. Um, and so with that, um, I actually want to introduce, and you just met uh, Liz Freitas, but I also want to introduce uh, Stephanie Reynosa, uh, who's our BCBA. And first of all, to thank both of them for all their work, but especially uh, the work of getting uh, ESY distance learning program uh, off and running. It was a huge success. And just one thing I do want to point out, one of probably the, I won't say faults, but one thing that we found out afterwards the amount of time that our staff, um, you know, our teachers, our related service staff, our paraprofessionals put in, um, even though they had started, e started distance learning uh, back in uh, March, uh, doing it through the ESY platform was very different. And so we found out a lot more work um, was needed. Um, and for this and for uh, many other reasons uh, during our pandemic, I, I really call them they've been our heroes, um, you know, to develop a distance learning plan, to come back and develop an ESY distance learning plan, um, and then finally to come back and do a hybrid program. But really, they're, they're our heroes of our community. And so with that being said, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Liz and Stephanie. So thank you, John. Um, I, I do want to highlight how much the teachers were able to offer to make this work. We provided a four day a week program for three hours a day. Um, and again, students were provided with an asynchronous and synchronous learning model so that we could provide continuous learning opportunities to our students who had IEPs. Um, this came at a time when teachers had just finished up an unprecedented school year. Um, they had put their hearts and souls into supporting students through closure um, and worked well beyond the school day. 
and probably were thinking that they were going to wrap this up for a beautiful summer vacation. Yet when called to task, they dug deep and they were able to provide a tremendous program to 90 students who participated out of the 104 that were recommended. Um, so this isn't a small program. Um, this was a big responsibility and had a lot of work that went along with it. Um, and yet when they needed a screen break, they, they kept on going. Um, the teachers dug deep and provided exceptional services to our students without hesitation or exception. Um, they had taught the previous years and they were eager to rejoin, um, which really provided everybody with a lot of um, renewed energy to get us through the summer. Um, it was inspiring and, and really, really powerful. So we were able to service um, our pre-K through um, 12 students. We had five preschoolers that attended. Um, we had 64 students grades K through six who attended and 10 secondary students. 33 of our students received related services such as speech and language or OT um, occupational or physical therapy services. Um, we also had 14 students that participated in our structured literacy program, which was in addition to their IEP services and three students that attended camp. Um, so, so we had a very broad spectrum of services that were provided by um, many different staff members. Um, we had, as we had mentioned, teachers, um, an amazing team of teachers, pre K through 12, pre K through 12, um, as well as our LEAP or our ABA teachers um, and our STRIVE program was able to be sustained throughout the summer. Um, related services were provided by Stephanie Renozo, who, who's here with us this evening, um, and also our OT, PT, and speech and language. Lisa Helvey, one of um, Highcrest speech and language uh, therapists, took upon herself an additional role and provided SLP supervision for a new um, speech and language pathologist. And this was a first year experience that Lisa was able to provide supervision to this during this unique time. Let me tell you, this speech and language teacher got a wealth of knowledge from Lisa. She is a talented individual. Um, we were also able to provide services um, with our dedicated para and behavior specialist staff. We really could not have done it without them. Um, it takes quite a number of staff to provide the services online um, and remotely, and they were there for the task. They provided services through one-to-one -one meets, um, and unique specialized instructions to our students to assure that they make progress. Um, we were also had a unique opportunity this year, something that we've provided to the program specific to this year, was the role of our counseling, of our school psychologist um, in efforts to provide counseling services. Um, and Kate Jubendell um, was able to provide those services to our students. Um, as well as keep a focus on the social emotional learning of our students, um, which was oh, yeah. this summer. Um, Hi. To we died carefully. To engage families um, who had needs during these very unique times. We just found that an exceptionally valuable participant and look forward to that position continuing um, for the upcoming summer program. Uh, we also had a special education teacher intern join us, um, our own Mrs. Beardsley. She's at the, she's a science teacher at SDMS, um, and she was able to really engage with us as well. Um, her, along with Kate and Stephanie, were able to chair our engagement committee teams, and that's where we really gathered the information of those students that were engaged or struggling to engage, um, and those students that needed some additional help. Stephanie, would you like to speak to that? Sure, thank you so much for having me. Um, so the engagement team meetings, I have to say, were really productive. We were able to meet with every single certified staff, both um, the teachers and the related service staff every single week and get a rundown of every single student in the program. Every student that was doing well, that was struggling to engage, that needed help, that was coming to the meetings, but maybe not necessarily, you know, achieving their goals and objectives in that first, you know, week or so. We met with everybody every single week, um, and it was really productive. We were able to 
come up with ideas on how we could get them to participate better. We were able to um, get individuals that were maybe not coming to the computer, but the families are really interested in getting them to engage. A lot of what we did was provide them with support and feedback and sometimes joined them at future meetings. We also had a behavior specialist joining us at all of our engagement team meetings. So she was able to then go with those teachers and help implement some procedures that we um, had suggested. So one of the things we had suggested with one of our students that was failing to come to the computer was to kind of take a step back and just sort of let's talk about what they like and make coming to the computer exciting. And um, that was really you know, helpful for that family. And then the student was able to build that relationship with the staff and then start to participate in some of their um, goals and objectives. Uh, we were also able to get a student that was unable to participate in a lot of ESY instruction actually in person and in the springtime um, through the same method, through talking with this student, finding what their interests were, and making coming to the computer really exciting. Um, I don't think I really, is there, is there anything else I'm missing about our engagement team meetings? No, just overall, we had 87% of our students engaged in our ESY program, um, leaving only a little under 8% that didn't participate, um, and then a small group that either declined or moved. Um, but it was really the unique opportunity of the staff, um, the students, as well as the parents' collaboration to get our students engaged throughout, throughout summer. This is a summer program where they again had to continue online learning um, and working together. Um, it's really our staff's commitment that along with our parents um, partnership that made this happen. And I'll just add, I think usually uh, during ESY, a lot of the meetings are sort of on the run <laughs> because we're running the program. It was nice to be able to really have that collaborative time um, with the different related services, uh, and you know, a behavior specialist, and you know, everyone else to come together and uh, talk about each individual class and how things were going. That's something through uh, live in person uh, uh, programs that we really weren't able to do. I will second that. I was actually speaking to to Kate Juvenville today when we were talking about different stories for this meeting, and we had said it was really nice to be able to have. 15 to 20 minutes every week to talk about every student. We talked about all the students that were enrolled and all the students that were doing well or struggling every single week, when normally it would be a pop-in every day and it's not necessarily you know, discussing that. So that was one of the great benefits is that we were able to go over every single student and come up with a plan to get them engaged. And it really gave us the opportunity to learn more about our families learn more about what their successes are, what their goals are, and really what their struggles were through this distance learning model. Um, so it did really provide an opportunity for us to get to know people so much better. Um, as a result, um, we had some very positive student outcomes. These are just some of the examples of um, the achievements that our students had accomplished over throughout the ESY program. Um, Despite the hurdles of technology, getting on the screen, um, participating remotely, they really, really were able to excel. Um, we learned a lot of valuable lessons and we learned a lot of new skills that we'll take with us moving forward into next year's ESY. Um, we'll leave behind the school closure and the pandemic and we'll take with us <laughs> some new practices and new procedures. Um, our improved data collection systems, um, our improved shared formative data, um, and our collaboration techniques. Um, never do again do I wish to start an ESY program like this. Um, never do again do I wish to face this challenge. <laughs> um, but certainly with the skill and the commitment from the team, from all of the staff involved, and our tenacious and st tenacious students that are full of grit and tenacity, they were able to do the job and it was a true success. So I compliment them all. Great. And, and so with it, 
two, am I unmuted? Yep, with the two, I, I do want to uh, thank um, our leadership, uh, you know, Mike Emmett and Sally Distoli, because I think I was at their uh, door um, every single morning saying, what's a decision? Because really, I mean, it came upon us, you know, and we had to make a decision. We made it within nine days, and that was with information changing every day. And, you know, I'm glad to say you made the right decision. I saw other, you know, towns um, not fare well with uh, live learning. And as I said, um, really, we're ready now for it. I don't think we would have been ready July 6. Mm. And it would have been testing our wrong students to make that decision. Mm. So Liz and uh, Stephanie, thank you very much. Any questions from the board? Any questions or comments? Oh, just a comment, thank you. Uh, that's a lot of work. Thank you. Our pleasure. <laughs> I had a comment. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for their efforts. Um, you know, PJ is in that uh, program and certainly uh, benefited from it. I had heard that the, um, you know, that the speech uh, therapy was, was excellent. So um, it's much appreciated. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. And Liz said, I just wanted to know how a um, student I'm talking about our student teacher can learn better from anyone uh, than Lisa Helvey. She is outstanding. And so under her guidance, oof, what a learning experience. I just want to say well done and thank you for all the effort and time that was put into this and uh, the commitment to show that you're a true uh, educator. Thank you. Yeah, good way to say it, John. Thank you. Anyone else? John, can I just say, I have to thank all our teachers for that, really, because, I mean, not only did they have to do distance learning on March 16th and start it up, but here it was again that they were unsure one month before um, we opened the ESY, and then all of a sudden, here you go, it's distance learning again, do it again, and they really did. They, 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 were, they were exceptional. Um, yeah. um, I, you know, I'm sure across the state, teachers were working hard, but the teachers and staff at Weathersfield really truly put a commitment towards us, towards student learning, and it, it was incredibly impressive. They went above and beyond the three hours of work and the 30 minutes they yeah. got. Um, I mean, above and beyond, they were co communicating constantly, creating programming. It was, it was amazing, and all of the students truly benefited from all of the hard work. It was great to see. I think that this is a perfect example of Weathersfield's continued commitment to our students. Bottom line. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all your hard work and dedication to our students. It's definitely greatly appreciated. M Mr. Emery, was there another part of this presentation to class? Yes, we're going to learn a little bit about class at this point. <laughs> uh, Miss Lizzie Hammer. So I'm really excited to be here with Karen Marshall to talk about the um, pilot program that I want to say on about June 1st was a little seed in Sally's mind. Um, and by like June 15th, it bloomed into this massive flower. Um, we, t I think that to echo what um, John and Liz and Stephanie said about extended school year that before I say anything about the program it 110% was a success because of the teachers that we had in the program. Um, and I think by the end you're going to see what an experience we offered our regular education students in addition to our students who receive specialized services. So the goal of the pilot program was to provide all interested K-12 students with an opportunity to boost academic skills over the summer months. And this differs from the extended school year um, program that John and Liz just spoke about because it was offered to any interested K-12 student or family. So they didn't have to have an IEP or a 504 plan to participate in this. So it was open to anybody. The goal being not to provide that specialized instruction that the extended school year provides, rather to boost academic skills. So for some students who enrolled in the program, the, the program provided some readiness for the fall. For other students, it truly boosted and helped avoid that summer slide. And for some of the students that participated, it really was some enrichment. So in the, I'll be speaking about the K-6 because I was the uh, program coordinator for the K-6 version. Karen will be speaking when she's talking about the 712. 
Um, in terms of the model of this pilot program, it ran for six weeks from June 22nd to July 30th. And we offered this program three days a week, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And depending on the grade level, um, students received about two and a half hours to four hours of instructional time per week. For our primary students in kindergarten and first grade, they received one hour a week with the teacher, and then they had one and a half hours of kind of some independent practice activities. For our grades two through six students, they had two hours a week with the teacher, and they had two hours of independent activities. Um, it differed a little bit from the programming that we offered in distance learning in the spring because one important component of the program that we felt was some more synchronous live lessons with the teachers. Um, so part of that instructional face-to-face -face time was live small groups with uh, the teacher. We utilized the distance learning platforms that many of our students experienced in the spring. Um, our incoming kindergarten and first graders utilized Seesaw, and our incoming second through sixth graders utilize Google Classroom. And while we used resources from our Weathersfield Public Schools curriculum, we really encourage teachers to think thematically and plan integrated units. So in kindergarten, one of the units that was really successful was a unit on ice cream. Uh -huh. And the teachers, the, uh, the K teachers work together to think about um, how could we use ice cream to teach some SEL and turn taking skills. So the kids talked about um, sharing their favorite ice cream flavor. They integrated math with graphing those favorite ice cream flavors. They practiced motor skills and direction following when they did a directed drawing of an ice cream cone. And they did a lot of literacy work around reading ice cream themed books and writing personal narrative stories about times that they had ice cream. So it really allowed the teachers, and, and we'll see a little bit later in the presentation, teachers really enjoyed having this opportunity to kind of plan thematically versus just following a scope and sequence of a curriculum. The model that we used for the secondary level, which would be our grade seven through 12, was done through the Ingenuity platform. It's an online uh, uh, platform that provides different coursework that would be uh, core standards for Connecticut. They have different state standards. But it would be five days a week. Students would have the opportunity to use the weekends if they happen to get a little further behind or uh, work through the course at a slower pace. The average would be about 1.5 hours of instructional lessons per course per day. Um, and it would be an independent, self-directed learning model, uh, different from what the elementary model was. Um, the courses were very comprehensive. They included teacher tutorial videos. They had um, reviews, quizzes, so it was uh, totally comprehensive. We did supply them with some other resources if they got stuck, uh, similar to like Khan Academy or Purdue Writing Lab, um, just in case they needed extra resources. Student progress was tracked with a three week scheduled daily lesson outline and it actually had a visual timeline to it. So the program ran from June 22nd through July 30th in two three-week se sessions. So we had like session one and session two. Um, progress reports were automatically emailed to parents on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, the progress reports were pretty comprehensive also. They told the number of minutes that a child would have worked on their lessons. They gave what the uh, grade would be at the time. So they had a lot of information so that the parents were kept uh, uh, abreast of what the students were doing and could support them. So in terms of enrollment in the K-6 program, initially we were not really sure what to expect. Part of me thought that parents and families and kids were gonna be fried after DLP 1.0 and they'd wanna completely disconnect this summer. Um, and part of me thought that there would be families and students who were thirsty for more because they felt like the spring was a little less than, you know, less traditional than, than the normal school year. 
Um, so enrollment really truly had to evolve and we worked really hard as a program to respond to the need in our community. Um, initially, we were going to staff nine classrooms and service about 180 kids. And what ended up having to happen after the um, enrollment survey went live and every classroom filled within an hour and a half is that we had to adjust. Um, by the end of our program, we ended up servicing 380 elementary students and we staffed 19 classrooms. Um, thank goodness we had such dedicated teachers. We had many of our teachers doing double duty, running an AM session and a PM session. Um, so we really, I feel very proud that we were able to respond in this crazy time to something that was clearly a need in our community and provide some sense some sort of normalcy for our um, parents and, and students. Our 712 pilot program consisted of 90 enrolled students. There were 153 courses that were registered, 18 single course and 68 two courses. So the majority of our students actually signed up for two courses. Um, we had 41 seventh graders, 23 eighth graders, so 75% of our enrollment for our class program would have come from the middle school students. But we had 14 ninth graders, 10 10th graders, and two 12th graders. So I think one of the most important measures of the success of this program is not only how students performed, but how, what families thought about this program and knowing that they were giving up a portion of this summer and in many cases supporting their students through this um, continued learning across the summer session, we felt it was important to survey our families. Um, so there's some data on the screen and that represents 117 survey responses. Overall, if you look across the data, the families responded extremely positively to this program. And 89% of our families agree, agree or strongly agree that their child's experience was positive engaging. And 92% of those families would enroll their children in class if offered again. <clears throat> Go ahead, Sally. Um, I wanted to capture some of the big ideas around the feedback and, and some of the information that parents provided us around why they felt the program was so successful. And when we look across all of the responses to the questions around what did you find was the most valuable aspect, there were some themes noted across all 117 responses. One, parents and students really appreciated the small group instructional design. In our K-6 program, we were able to keep groups to about four students per teacher. Mm -hmm. So for that 20 minutes or half hour a day, students were able to engage with the teacher in a very small group. They also appreciated having that live synchronous FaceTime, knowing that those three days a week, every day at 10 o'clock, they were gonna log in and receive some direct instruction from a certified teacher. Parents it reported that they also appreciated that their kids had other peers to engage with. And I know this summer and spring felt extremely isolating, so it was nice that kids were able to come together in this, in this way this summer. And parents reported that the um, assignments were extremely engaging as well as the teachers. And teachers will say that planning thematically definitely led to high levels of engagement. We also asked for some feedback on improvement. If we were to offer this program again, what would be the things that parents would like to see um, changed? And one of the suggestions was to have specific class um, opportunities for different academic areas. So a literacy class or a math class or a science class. Um, parents actually asked for longer sessions. So instead of the 30 minutes with the teacher, they'd like more small groups and more FaceTime with the teacher. Um, they definitely want to continue having it in a small group with that, you know, teacher and, and four students. And they would, one of their biggest pieces of advice was please offer this program in next, next year and open up more spots. Mm. Um, so I, I thought that was a testament to how hard the teachers worked is that parents and kids were eager to come um, into school. Sally, you can go ahead. So the survey results that we received from the secondary uh, students' parents, um, overall, 
I think th the platform that we used was excellent. They um, really appreciated the, um, I think the challenge that the courses gave, um, that they thought um, the program was very beneficial to their child's learning. Many of the parents did suggest having meeting with teachers to support students who needed help. Um, but again, overall, we found that they were very satisfied with uh, the platform, the coursework, and the programs. And as a result, 89% um, of our families uh, agreed that our, uh, would enroll their students in the program again. Um, okay, a student survey that we uh, received results from um, they thought that the courses were fairly challenging. They, they thought that they would recommend taking this course um, for the following year or would recommend it for other uh, students and families. 87% um, of them would uh, recommend the whole class program, but most students who did answer the survey um, thought that they preferred possibly to improve the program to have some type of check-in or teacher support um, in the meetings uh, like they had similar in at the elementary level. Um, but overall, I think they were pleased with the courses that were offered to them. Um, just a couple of comments from parents that uh, stuck out in our survey. One said that they were surprised at how um, great the learning platform actually was and that normally they didn't see motivation in their eighth graders, which is an age we know sometimes can, uh, motivation can fluctuate. But um, they, the parents were very surprised at the methods, simple, straightforward, keeping the kids interested in the lessons and that they seemed to learn a lot. And then another parent, um, which a couple had voiced something similar to this, that they thought it was a fantastic way to move forward and offer options throughout the summer to keep the skills or enhance the skills um, on th with their students and children. So just to kind of end with some um, feedback from our class teachers, because they're truly the ones that led to the success of this program. And in addition to surveying families, we also wanted to survey our teachers and see what their experience was like. John and Liz and Stephanie talked about how we were just coming off a spring of distance learning, and then we jumped into this commitment of, you know, six weeks of pretty, pretty uh, intense summer learning. And all of the feedback from our class teachers was so incredibly positive. Um, one of the biggest things that they said was that collaboration truly was the key to their success in this program. Um, and Sally had an opportunity to sit in this kind of panel discussion that we had with teachers and she got to hear firsthand how they, they spoke about the ability to have um, time to do some in integrated planning that the teachers truly worked smarter and not harder and they spoke about dividing and conquering and really capitalizing on each other's strengths for the planning. So in our fifth and sixth grade um, group, we had teachers who were kind of specialty specializing in math versus reading and writing, and they really planned to their strengths. Um, one of our teachers commented at the very end, which um, really struck me, she said, I tried things I never tried before. This program and process as a teacher was beneficial. The program boosted even teacher learning. And I think across our 19 teachers, they would say they tried things and they learned things that they're gonna be able to carry forward into this um, crazy school year. Um, teachers also commented on the building relations, relationships and community virtual, virtually. Initially, we had thought, oh my goodness, if we have to start the year virtually and we never meet these kiddos face to face, how will I establish those relationships? But as one of our teachers said, she said, I was really nervous about how this would work, especially with kids across all five schools and with kids that I didn't know, but it totally did and really quickly. So it shows that it is possible to do. And I think that gave a great boost of confidence heading into the school year where we had our you know, cohort two just joining us virtually on those first couple days of school. Um, class teachers also report that even though it was summer, student engagement was really high. One teacher reported that kids wanted to come to this and then it made it more enjoyable for them to be teaching. 
and they attribute it to that small group, that kind of personalized instruction and that cross-curricular and, and thematic planning. Um, and I think the program definitely boosted more than just academics. For a lot of our kiddos, our kids coming in for kindergarten, it built great kindergarten readiness around technology skills. Um, I passed a parent in web, web hallway this week who said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that my child did the class program. They totally knew how to use Seesaw coming into school this week. Um, and teachers reported that it really helped build those peer connections across the building. And in many cases, it boosted student confidence. Um, we had a first grader at the beginning of the program who was extremely hesitant to participate and really struggled to get on camera. And by the end of the program, they were joining the meets before the teacher and they self-reported, um, a, a first grader said, I am unbelievable. Um, so I think it boosted so much more than academics for not only our students, but also our teachers. And overall, it was such a positive experience um, for all of our stakeholders. I'd just like to uh, thank both Karen Marshall and Jen Hammer. Um, as they mentioned, they really took this idea in probably in less than 30 days, uh, developed marketing materials, enrollment materials, um, helped uh, you know hire teachers, communicate with parents. Um, and again, as you see, our enrollment was fairly high, so it was no small task. Um, and to all the teachers, um, as our enrollment um, grew, we were able to um, twist a few arms and encourage a few teachers to join in on the summer fun and um, this type of opportunity wouldn't have been possible without our teachers um, being willing to engage in some summer learning uh, during their staycations and um, so I think it was a win-win uh, for our students as we came out of our distance learning but also wanted to reduce summer slide and boost their um, summer learning so thank you to everybody it was a great experience I think both for our students and our parents. Thank you, Mr. Stoli. Is there any questions or comments? I, I have a comment. Um, I think I'm, yes, Ms. Granato. I'm one of those lucky persons who walk, not walks around town, but hears from people in town that um, the teachers are fabulous, that they have gone above and beyond. They have made this successful. Um, so I so appreciate all the work that's gone into this on, on the fly in many, time, in many ways. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is I'm always interested in these um, 21st century courses, Sally, as we always are talking about them, um, as they used ingenuity in these high school 7 through 12 grades, did they take courses that were not offered, are not offered at our high school? I mean, did they take like marine biology or um, any, any course that we would not offer? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so this was a pilot program. Um, these were all uh, new programs that Ingenuity had uh, created to boost skills. So none of our secondary courses were credit bearing this summer. Um, so they didn't earn credit, but there was a way to refine and boost their skills, both in literacy and mathematics um, through the summer courses. Um, that is something we want to explore for the, for, uh, the future for possibility of some credit bearing courses. Um, but this summer with a short turnaround and being a pilot program, um, we wanted to start small. Yeah, well, even to find an interest through ingenuity would be um, a nice way to use it. Great. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Grena. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Carey, right. I see this as, uh, it, as it was a pilot program. I see that we've laid the groundwork for future uh, summer programming uh, for our students uh, in, in all of our schools. To see a number of, of 380 students after an extensive closure where you were largely online, that really speaks to the amount of interest and engagement that we had in our, within our family. So this will be something that we'll be looking to expand. I, too, to Sally's point, would certainly like to offer up the opportunity with our Ingenuity platform to be able to offer some credit-bearing courses now that we've got a year under our belt. So uh, this was a, a great amount of work, uh, administration, teachers, and students and families supporting it. So well done, everyone. Excellent. And I want to thank Ms. Hammer and Ms. Marshall for coming tonight and presenting. Also, I did have an incoming third grader and incoming freshman on those class freshmen? classes and they liked it incoming freshmen yeah wow so, so they enjoyed it and i appreciate it keeping my children academically engaged through the summer
But thank you again for taking your time to come tonight. Thank you. I don't know why my camera shut off. Sorry. Thank you. No, nope, no problem. Thank you. Is that all, Mr. Emmett? That's everything, yes. Thank you. Moving on, announcements and information, please check your packets. Uh, meetings held, there was none. Meetings scheduled, we have the Weather Soil Early Childhood Collaborative on the 14th at 4.30 p.m. We have the Correct Council on September 16th at 11.30, and we have finance and operation before the next board meeting at 6 p.m. There's no unfinished business. Chuck, Public comment? Chuck, can yes. I just say something about the meetings held? Yes. Can I go back? Um, during the summer, there were hat meetings, and there were um, people on the board and other people who did attend those, and that's our hunger action team. There's also Keen on Kids. Um, Judy Keen is desperate to get her programs back into the schools, but it all depends upon um, scheduling, of course. And also, CREC did have meetings during the summer, which were much smaller. They weren't all board meetings there would be a few board members with the executive director. So those were going on too. Okay, thank you. I mean, there's no unfinished business. Public comment, Mr. Emmett, anyone on the line? I have no one in the queue, Mr. Carey. Thank you. Board comments, anyone wishing to make comments, please do so. I just have a quick question. Uh, yes, Mr. Carey, give us an update. Yeah, how are the students doing that have chosen to stay home uh, how do they stay involved with their remote learning? Yeah, John, they, they have the ability, they're connected with the class, so they have the ability to join the um, classes online. So for example, last week over at Charles Wright, I visited the kindergarten classes and I sent you a, a few photos where you had a small group of students in cohort one in the classroom, socially distanced with masks on. And then the teacher projected the uh, computer. Everybody was on with the Google Meet. So I could go up to the camera and say hello to everybody learning remotely. I think the other piece that's gonna be critically important as these kids are gonna be remote five days a week is making sure that we keep them engaged monitor their attendance. And as Sally had mentioned earlier, we just received guidance from the state late on Friday with regard to keeping attendance. I will be charged with providing uh, attendance and enrollment data to the state uh, while we're in the hybrid model. So I think it's important with our remote learners to make sure that they continue to stay engaged. So we do understand that there is going to be a level of flexibility here. So we may have some uh, families that are currently doing remote that become more comfortable with the health metrics and want to have their kids return to school. So we'll facilitate that. Um, we do ask that parents give us a little bit of leeway with the, being, you know, making sure that we have transportation set up and preparing to figure out which cohort um, the students are in to make sure we balance out the numbers. Thank you. I also, if I could just ask uh, with the DPH guidelines regarding uh, CIAC sports and the football and the decision that was made, are we going to see other athletic programs uh, such as what's happened to football, such as uh, are we going to be looking at wrestling? Uh, has there been any discussion regarding those contact sports, uh, you know, even down to, um, you know, anything else? because we have been flooded with questions, I'm sure you have, and yeah. we do want to respect what the Department of Public Health is saying, but we also want to respect those students who are missing out their football season. So I, I don't want to lead them on if we know something now with some other given sports or activities, are we going to research that now or are they going to catch as catch can as we go into the programs? Yeah, you bring up a very valid uh, point, John. And when you think about winter sports, I mean, right now we're just getting started with fall sports, but wrestling being a winter sport, ice hockey is another one that would be a high risk, as well as both boys and girls basketball. At this point in time, the CIAC has done nothing in terms of any guidelines around winter sports. It has all been fall sports. Um, like with girls volleyball, you know, what we've done to stick, to stick with the guidelines, we've done a blended program of outside for conditioning where the girls can be socially distanced and not be in masks. 
And when they come into the gym for skills, then they wear masks. The CIAC said with regard to, there were two sports that were identified as high risk, those being football as well as girls volleyball. Girls volleyball got the okay through the DPH and CIAC. However, the mandate of having masks during competition is there. So we will move forward with girls volleyball. Um, frankly, I have some reservation around soccer. I've been to enough soccer matches over at Catone Field to see both boys and girls that they're heavily engaged. But right now, CIAC, as well as the DPH, do not see soccer as a high risk. So we're going to continue to move forward with, with those fall sports. To your point about the students kind of being led along, yeah, that's a real concern for me, John. You know, these guys have done um, training since uh, July. We had guidelines where we were in cohorts of 10, uh, 10 to a coach. They had to have masks both down to the field and up from the field. They had to be socially distanced and they did exactly what they needed to do. The reality right now is we're operating under guidelines that show that football is not a safe sport. As I mentioned earlier in communications, I'm waiting to see if they ultimately make a decision to move football to the spring. There was discussion about that during the summer and CIAC said no to that. So um, I'm kind of curious as to why they would have not considered swapping out say baseball, softball with football, given that baseball is a much you know, a lower risk sport. But again, I don't operate the CIAC. Uh, as a superintendent, I know I speak with my fellow superintendents all the time. There is quite a level of frustration with regard to how long it has taken to, to come forward with this, uh, this information. Uh, Mr. Maltesi did meet with the football team last week when the CIAC came out with the decision. And the moment I get the CIAC decisions and, and communications, I get them out to you. So we'll continue to do the best we can to provide an experience for our kids that obviously focuses on health and safety first. So thank you for the question, John. No, I, you know, I think that we're all behind the students and we're very disappointed as a community that the football season was uh, removed from the schedule and the students that are involved with the football uh, really, really uh, worked hard and they promoted good, safe skills. So, you know, with them, I want to thank that, those students, but being very disappointed the way and the manner it was handled not by us, but by mm -hmm. the Department of Public Health. Understood. Um, the other, uh, just some observations and goals. Um, you know, I know in the Hartford Current, they indicated that Weathersfield was hopeful that they were gonna be move, going back into full learning by November 1st. Is that still something out there? Or is that just, there was a chart of all the schools that were heading down. Are we moving in that direction? Yet at this point in time, John, we are planned out to be in the hybrid model through October. Uh, as Sally uh, mentioned in her presentation, we're looking at that two month period. I will tell you that talking with my colleagues, there are some that are looking to go full time as early as September 21st. There are others that are going uh, to stick with the hybrid through December 31st. And it's really dependent upon the district. And you know what's interesting, some of our neighboring districts, I, I've gotten several um, comments from parents around, well, you know, this district is doing full time in school. One of the realities that we have to face, and I've said this before, we have limited space specifically in our elementaries as well as even our middle, and in some cases our high school. Um, we did our survey in early August. We had a robust number of parents that selected the hybrid. We had only approximately 20% of our families choose to do full remote. Some of our neighboring districts had a uh, percentage of families choosing to do remote that was more than double that. So they're able to reopen fully, but they've only got half of the students. So it's essentially the same thing as a hybrid. Um, John, I think the important thing to remember and to let the public know is that we're going to continue to monitor the health data on a weekly basis. That's going to be the key indicator, talking with Charles from the CCHD, as well as getting that school health metric as well. I will be very interested to see, as we just had a stellar weekend weather-wise, and mm -hmm. would imagine as the last unofficial weekend of the summer, um, I'll be interested to see over the next two weeks if we see a spike. 
Um, certainly in some areas of the state, we have seen a spike. We've seen a spike in Danbury. We had seen a spike in East Windsor. There was a spike in New Haven. And we're seeing on college campuses as well. Um, not all of our students at the college level are my, my, maintaining that social distance. So we're definitely seeing clusters come up. So we're going to continue to monitor that. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you, Ms. Ariat. I Ms. think Middletown Paradise. shut. I think Middletown shut down the whole sports program today. The Middletown school system. I came across on one of those blurbs on the TV. You know, Middletown shut down everything, just like that. No given reason. Yeah, from the news, but it should be on tonight's news. So, Michael, it is fluid, and I support exactly what you're doing. I think you've taken into consideration the health of your staff and the health of the children as the utmost step before we open, and I appreciate that very much. You've always put the children first. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right. I oh, yes. had a comment. I just wanted to um, thank uh, Matt and Mike and the board for approving the Chromebooks in the spring because I'm hearing the same thing. There are districts that don't have computers and that makes uh, distance learning uh, very difficult. And also, Mike, I'll be getting in touch with you because uh, Catherine O'Connor is uh, forwarding a book uh, to me, The Snowman Choir. So uh, she had her uh, presentation last fall with one of her books. She's forwarding another uh, to go to the uh, Hamner Library. Excellent. Our, our uh, Hamner alum and accomplished author. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jim. And again, I just have to say, it's leadership from the, the board perspective as well. Um, you know, we heard from our tech team that we were, there was concern about having technology devices. The board agreed, you know, in spite of a difficult budget situation, the board agreed to enter into that lease. Yeah, you know, I think about it, those um, Chromebooks came in during the summer, we actually utilized uh, some of our crossing guards to help the tech team to get those things rolled out. And to know that we haven't skipped a beat when I'm hearing from some of my colleagues that they will not get their shipment of Chromebooks until November. Um, that was innovative and forward thinking. So thank you, board. Excellent. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Stay health healthy. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. Good night.